traditionally we talk about like drugs and alcohol being tied to creativity because these are all things that like suppress your left hemisphere hmm. so like you don't have to do drugs you can like if you want to be creative you can like go on a run right yeah right yeah <laughs> like get your cardio in but you should pick one or the other <laughs> you gotta do something <laughs> What's up, man? Not much. I'm here. Alan Gannett. Yeah, you pronounced it right. I, that was amazing. Um, I'm dyslexic. Okay. So I'm impressed. Full disclosure, I thought it was like Garnett for a long time. I'll, I'll respond to whatever you want to call me. I read your book. How'd and you find it? There's another comedian by the name of Brian Callen. Yeah, I know Brian. Comedian. Brian's awesome. Yeah. I did his podcast. He's great. Awesome. Yeah, he's great. I should have just we listened love Brian. to that, And then we could have saved ourselves a <laughs> conversation. Brian's really fun. So stand-up comedy thing is really interesting because I think the funniest thing about stand-up is that people think like your whole job is to make it seem very organic. Yeah. But you guys spend like months, years working out jokes, mm -hmm. like literally to the, like the breath and the pause and like sure. every eye movement, it can be like very, very practiced and rehearsed. Yeah. Like the whole sure. idea of like working out jokes, but like your end goal is like to literally go up there and have people think you're just like shooting the shit. Yeah. Isn't that weird? Yeah. But you're not, you're like, you're yeah, like, it's hard work. Well, sometimes, yeah. I mean, the way I do it, it's kind of a mixture between shooting the shit Really? And That's cool. Yeah. Well, it is and it isn't. Yeah. Depending on what circles you run in. It's like some people think that that's a, you should have every word, blah, blah, really? blah. And then some people think like. Do you sometimes bomb in. it? Oh, for sure. <laughs> Not anymore. I'm pretty good now. <laughs> but I, I was in a situation the other night where I was just at a bar and there were 10 people and it was the first show they had at this bar. So what happens then is all of a sudden you're invading somebody's favorite yeah. Tuesday night. Like why the out. fuck is a comedian here? Like, yeah. Oh, I came here to watch the game yeah. and now the game is off and somebody, I don't know. Is talking. <laughs> so this is the worst. So in, in situations like that, you got to kind of, um, earn your reason to stay in front of me. Totally. <laughs> um, that's really cool. And then did you ever watch the Jerry Seinfeld special on Netflix where they show probably the picture of like him in a courtyard surrounded by all the papers of all of his joke pads. No, and it's just like literally fills an entire courtyard in some park. Cause yeah. he had like so many pads. Like uh -huh. it's like a real job. Yeah. Like I could pull out a bunch. Yeah. Right now. It's crazy. Bunch of unfunny. I'm like pads. very intimidated by standup comedians in a good way. Cause oh, I dude. think like, it's very like, I would want to be a stand. Like it seems like it'd be really fun, uh -huh. but I'm like, Oh my God, that's like 10 years of hard work. Yeah, to get for there. sure. Yeah. That's the thing. Um, there's a lot of people that recommend not recommending stand up yeah. to people just because it's kind of depending on where you go, like in LA, it's really crowded yeah. there's like a lot of us and stage time is kind of oh um, interesting hard to come by sometimes there's only so many comedy clubs yeah. yeah so there's a lot of people being like don't encourage anybody else to be a stand-up comedian but i always do it because i know as soon as people start to realize what they have to do to make it good yeah. most people will just yeah stop. and the ones who stick with it will stick with it yeah yeah and there are some people who shouldn't who do and it's all fast <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, man. You know? And this crazy. is your apartment. This is my we, apartment. You live here. I live here with a wife and a roommate. YouTube. You can see. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah, stuff yeah. happening. Yeah. <laughs> every every day, different things. We, oh, my God. We Airbnb out the uh, the living room. Oh, this so is like the true like LA out. thing. Yeah. <laughs> no. Would no, you really not. Airbnb the living no, room? No, we're not. Oh, okay. Um, uh, not fancy enough. But we're not, we don't have enough foresight to sublet <laughs> our apartment. But yeah, we have a roommate and a dog. And then Where's the, the dog? And the dog are, they're moving out. They're in the process of moving out. Where's the dog right now? Like a year. I'm not really here. concerned. Not here. Are you afraid of dogs? I love dogs. I'm just concerned where the dog is. Oh, where do well, you go? you missed out on a great dog. Okay. Yeah. But <laughs> I, I've confirmed the safety of the dog. Okay, you, know, <laughs> you don't have to worry about that at all. But it is a good one. I'm sorry you missed out. <laughs> um, so I should probably start by giving you some kind of introduction so everybody understands why I like you so you much. You already pronounced my name right, so you're fine. That's you're pretty good. much yeah, it. Yeah. You wrote a book. Your name is Alan Gannett. Thank you for coming. Uh, you wrote a book called The Creative Curve. How many years ago by this point? The book came out literally a year ago to the day awesome. that we're recording this. I, full disclosure, listened to it oh on my an God. audio book. Yeah, I had, so I'm very familiar with your voice. And my, I had strep throat when we were recording that. <laughs> and so I'm like really projecting. And it's funny because like if you read the audiobook reviews, like 80% of the people are like, oh, great book. Like so much fun. Love that he narrated. 20% are like, what the is wrong with his voice? 20%? Like, that's pretty good. Yeah. It's like they're like, what is wrong with it? And I'm like, oh, my God. So yeah. like if you ever have to record an audiobook, like definitely don't – definitely cancel. If you I have. had the option and I didn't want to do it. Oh, it's fun. But like I was like 
I'm like a martyr and I was like, Oh, like I'll do it with strep. Like it doesn't matter. Did like, you, did you ever hear about the Michael Jordan flu game? No, there was one, I forget which year it was, but one of the games of the finals, he played through the flu did and that's good? like, that's you. Oh, Oh my God. <laughs> that's and what you did. Did he do? Okay. <laughs> yeah. He did okay. Great. Good. Okay. Yeah. Good. There's a shoe that came out and, uh, commemorates the, <laughs> the flu game. Yeah. So you have your own, you should have your own shoe. As Audiobook well, so. recording is really funny. Cause you're literally in like this little tiny studio room uh -huh. and it's 22 hours of recording. And the thing that like you kind of like is weird is like when you listen to audiobook, like they don't breathe. Uh -huh. And so when I first started recording it, I was like not breathing. Cause I thought like, <laughs> that's how you had to do it. Breathe. And they were like, no, no, we just like edit out the breath. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, and that made it yeah. a lot better. Okay, yeah. here we go. Let's start over. How long do you do at a time? Um, you do, you do three eight-hour days, so seven eight oh, hours wow. a day. Yeah, Very for taxing. three days. Uh, you get it's home super and not talk to anybody. It's super taxing, and you have like throat coat tea, and you're like, yeah. And by yeah. the end of it, like you sound really sexy, right? But, yeah, but you good. also had like an IV to make yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I literally <laughs> had this bag of like Advil, Sudafed, throat. Like I had like the whole thing. Nice. And I went to the doctor on the last day, and I was like, got like the rapid strep test, which always says you don't have strep. Yeah. And it was like you have strep, and I was like, even the rapid. Yeah, yeah. Right. So I had like strep, strep. Shit. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna listen to it again yeah. now Oof, with a new geez. perspective. Yeah. <laughs> but you wrote this book about um, the creative curve. Which is a thing that you coined or something else? It's, um, it's, I branded the term. It's a, the academic term, which is not a good book title is <laughs> the, the inverted U shape relationship between familiarity and not between familiarity and preference. You would need three. Yeah. That was uh, not good. Covers. So like hashtag marketing. Yeah. Like it was totally <laughs> smart. So I didn't come up with it, but I gave it a better name. Cool. So, yeah. Um, and that's kind of about how the, why don't you Yeah. Just... So the book is basically tackling a few things. So. Um, the book is investigating this question of like, can you learn to become more creative? Like that's the sort of the basic question. Because it, people think creative people are just born. It's like magical. And if you watch the history channel and the like genius series they have, it like seems like that. And yeah. so the book like sort of investigates this question and looks in a few different lenses. So it looks at like academic. So like I look at all the research around creativity, historical, like I spent a lot of time looking at the history of these sort of creative geniuses we talk about. Mm -hmm. And like we can talk about some of my least favorite and favorite later. And then I interviewed 25 living creatives. So yeah. these are like folks like Ted Serrano's from Netflix, um, sort of in the entertainment world, like Brenda Chapman, the first woman to win the Oscar for best animated film, Kenya Barris, the creator of Blackish, like uh, David Rubenstein is a billionaire. Like it's really mm. eclectic. And there was creative. a YouTuber, Connor. Uh, Connor Franta and yeah. Casey Neistat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, who, by the way, when I'm giving like talks about the book, I say, <laughs> Casey Neistat, comma, professional bro. Yeah. And I'm like always really worried he's going to like somehow hear that I'm like dunking on him and get mad at me. But anyway, so. Ah, um, well, if that's the aura. Yeah. That, you're exactly. just describing yeah, I'm the just aura. describing it correctly. So basically in the book, I sort of interrogate these things. And one of the findings is that one of the biggest things that people get confused about with creativity is that like, well, certain ideas take off. And mm -hmm. like that's so crazy that certain ideas take off that it must be sort of magical. And in reality, there's all this science um, about what I call the creative curve or the inverted, you know, and basically <laughs> what it is, one. is yeah. there's this relationship that scientists have found at the individual level, the group level and the population level where the ideas that tend to take off are this blend of the familiar and the novel. Mm -hmm. And let's break down why. So we might think that creativity is all about novelty. But in reality, here's a new thing. yeah, here's like a wild innovation. Right? Yeah, yeah. But in reality, our brain is actually really scared of things that are unfamiliar because we think it might hurt us. Like imagine you like broke into someone's house mm -hmm. and you like go into the basement. There's some like creepy ass door and you're like, I'm not going in the door. Like I don't want to die. Yeah. Right now. I'd like to seek a more familiar door. Yeah, a more familiar. But if you were in your grandmother's house yeah. and you went to the basement. And Am I still breaking it? Same creepy door. Yeah, it was really <laughs> no matter. Her. It was the same creepy door, like physically the same. It would completely change your perspective on it because it's familiar. You're like, oh, I'm just going to go in this door. It's fine. Right. So things that are unfamiliar are scary. Okay. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. So they've done all these studies where they find that the more someone's exposed to something, the more they like it. Like this is why we have like logos and brand colors and all this stuff. Yeah. But then there's this like other problem, which is that, okay, if the more familiar something is, the more we like it. Well then how come like eventually we get bored of things, uh -huh. right? Eventually we're like this new Drake song sucks, right? Sure. So you're like, yes, Drake. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> he's, he's my next guest. Yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> um, it turns out there's this other part of our brain, which basically says that 
we also seek out things that are novel because they represent potential rewards. So like mm -hmm. if you were a caveman and you found you super like, hard to picture, super right? hard to picture <laughs> and you were like foraging and you saw some weird berry you've never seen before, you might be like, Oh, I'm going to eat this. It might be breakfast. Yeah. So like it represents potential reward. So as humans, we have this other urge to seek out things that are novel and new. So like we like new restaurants, new food, new mm -hmm. experiences. And so these two contradictory forces, our pursuit of the familiar for safety and the pursuit of the novel for potential reward yeah. are like a direct contradiction. So how they manifest is basically this curve relationship where if you're listening, I'm going to try and describe it. It's like an upside down turtle. Everybody's watching. Yeah. Great. Okay. Good. It's an upside down turtle. And so basically it goes like this. And when an idea is brand new, it's too unfamiliar. People mm -hmm. are like, what is this? So like the first time you hear a new song, sometimes you're like, man, eh, it's fine. But then the more you're exposed to it, the more you like it. And you sort of start going up in preference. And at a certain point, you're like, it's overexposed. Like you've heard nice for what that Drake song too many times. You're like yeah. nice for nothing, right? Yeah, Done. Yeah, yeah. And then you start liking it less and less with each additional exposure. So what you find is that the ideas that do really well are the ideas that are familiar enough to be safe, but novel enough to be interesting. And they're in that sweet spot of the curve. And so like a great example is like Star Wars was a Western in space, mm -hmm. right? Um, the iPad was an iPhone without a phone. The iPhone was an iPod with a phone. The iPod was a better MP3 player, right. right? So what you find when you actually look at creative success is that the best ideas are ideas that have one foot in the familiar and one foot in the novel. Mm -hmm. And the best creators are actually the ones that are able to repeatedly create ideas in this sort of tension spot. Yeah. And the book goes into how like that's not actually magic, that's just process. Sure. And you were saying that um, most people that do well excel in that kind of thing are people who have uh consumed a ridiculous amount of yeah so basically i break down so i did all these interviews and i found these four attributes that i found over and over again in these people who are like really good at this the one that i think is most surprising to me is that we have this sort of mythology of creatives as very very productive like they're always doing they're always creating they're yeah. always putting stuff out there but in reality, when you actually interview successful creatives, they're like, yo, I like wrote the screenplay and took a year off, uh -huh. right? And the thing they actually do consistently is they actually consume consistently. So I found that over and over again, the most successful creatives are these like rabid, obsessive consumers. I talk about, for example, in the book, like Ted Sarandos, Chief Content Officer Netflix. He started his career literally as an 18 year old clerk at a video the rental video store, store. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. watched every single movie in the store. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that story is not unique. Quentin Tarantino did the same thing. He talks about this. Yeah. Um, you know, I talk about Nina Jacobson, who's the producer behind Hunger Games, Crazy Rich Asians, People vs. OJ Simpson. She started her career as a script reader. And you find that. So she's read all these she's things. She's read all these she's things. She's like, what are we lacking? Exactly. Yeah. And you find this that. Um, the people who've had really long careers, what they do is they keep doing this throughout their entire career. Mm -hmm. So like I interview these like musicians and like even after they're famous, even if they have multiple platinum albums, they're still like listening to huge amounts of music because basically how your brain works is the right hemisphere where creativity happens is actually really good at coming up with new and interesting ideas. Mm -hmm. But you need to like have the dots that you want to connect. Right. If you want to have new ideas, they don't just come from nowhere. Mm -hmm. Like if you've never consumed any music, you shouldn't expect to wake up, you know, thinking of new melodies or new tunes. But in the same way, like if you never watch stand up comedy, it's much harder for you to sort of understand, like, what are the different things that are out there? How do you put jokes together? How yeah. do you do this stuff? And so oftentimes when people mistake these sort of like, oh, like he or she had all these aha moments, it's magical, whatever. It's like, no, he or she actually like consumed huge amounts of material and then their brain did the rest right that's super interesting yeah and, and it's it, like you should it's okay to like not always be producing yeah that's nice and that's something that i can do <laughs> <laughs> try to convince myself dude i remember even when we were on our honeymoon we got married like three years ago and i was on my honeymoon like making flyers for stand-up shows yeah. that were happening on the way back yeah, yeah. And she's like just take a break. It's like, <laughs> Chill. It's super hard for me Chill. to take a break. Chill. But you need one of the things that's interesting is with your right hemisphere. So basically you have this left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. And the left hemisphere is where you do like logical processing. It's so like a math problem. And it's very step by step. So mm -hmm. like each step of the problem, you're like doing it. And you think like, okay, I'm doing long division. It's very conscious. Your right hemisphere is sort of like 
quietly working on problems and only once it gets the answer is it sort of like hey i got the answer Uh uh-huh and so like the metaphor i like is think about your left hemisphere and your right hemisphere as like your loud lab partner in class like your quiet lab partner like your left hemisphere is like okay guys like we're gonna do this and then this and then this and look we got the answer like good job team right and then the quiet lab partner is like okay we're like working on the problem and like hey i got the answer but if the left hemisphere is too loud, if there's too much stuff going on, you don't hear what's been going on in the right hemisphere. Uh-huh. So what you find is that you hear a lot of stories about creativity happening in the shower, on your walk, when you're not doing in your stuff. commute, yeah. yeah, when you're at the gym. And it's not that like the shower is like inspiring, although like you know I've been working out. Um, you could, yeah, <laughs> but I got a chalkboard. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's good. New tile work. <laughs> yeah. But it's like those are all moments when your left hemisphere is sort of like quieter, so you can hear quote unquote what's been going on in your right hemisphere. Yeah. And this is also why traditionally we talk about like drugs and alcohol being tied to creativity because these are all things that like suppress your left hemisphere. Hmm. So like you don't have to do drugs. You can like, if you want to be creative, you can like go on a run. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like get your cardio in. <laughs> but you should pick one or the other. <laughs> you got to do something. Yeah. Like, disclaimer. Yeah. Right. Just do something. <laughs> and uh, by the end of these, you have to choose one. Yeah, choose one. <laughs> and uh, and but, like, just Steve see how Jobs, it affects the rest of your life. <laughs> Steve Jobs famously. <laughs> there's consequences. <laughs> um, Steve Jobs famously would go on long walks in his neighborhood. Right? Yeah. Bill Gates That's spends my favorite, a man. week a year um, by himself in a cabin in the woods. Mm-hmm. It's like when the world's were just made, just goes to a cabin to like be away from it all. Yeah, yeah. But, like we live in this like ADD smartphone universe where like our left brain's constantly firing. You could always be doing something. Yeah, but you need to have silence. Mm-hmm. You literally need to. It's dude. That's so. When I was reading your book, there's so many things that match up, especially in the YouTube chapters, because I'm like, there's actually a real specific thing with Connor Franta mm-hmm. where you were talking about when he was like 12 or mm-hmm. whatever he was. Cons- consuming all these like tons advice of video. videos yeah. and i was like that would have been like 2009 2010 i wonder who he was watching yeah because like that's when i was doing like straight up beginning of the video was like here's the advice question i got and then when i was like at my most popular on youtube that's what i was doing in that time that's period. awesome so i was like oh, i wonder <laughs> it could have um, been <laughs> i was like say my name connor <laughs> so you've been doing youtube for like 10 years uh, as long as YouTube has been a site, that's so crazy. January, 2006. So it's almost like 13 years. That's crazy. Isn't that crazy? And my, so and I do is- feel like I'm doing things constantly yeah. always. But when I go home to the East coast, to Connecticut, a lot of times I'll do nothing for a week yeah. and I'll come back and I'll be like, my brain is so clear yeah. when I go on tour <laughs> and when I'm not like always in front of a camera or, um, or editing stuff. So much of my life for the past at least 12 years was standing in front of a desk or sitting at a laptop and editing myself, right? So now that I've delegated a lot of this stuff to other people, I don't spend the two or three hours it takes to edit yeah, what we're doing huge. now. And I could go fucking take a walk yeah. and write jokes and yeah. make everything that I'm doing a little hundred percent. And this is the same thing you find with like, I found with like writing the book. It was like meta writing a book about creativity. Cause you're like, as you're doing stuff, writing a book, it's like some of the things <laughs> were like, like literally I remember like some of the best things I did were like I was like frustrated once and I was like I'm just not gonna work on this for a week and like I was on a deadline but it's not gonna work on it. <laughs> right. and like after like three or four days you start coming up with random ideas and you come back to it with a whole new perspective and like that's part of the process yeah like, that's a sure. real part of the process dude I have friends who are like I need to upload an Instagram photo between 12 and 4 every day to keep whatever yeah, yeah. and I'm like dude if you just don't tweet yeah. for a little while <laughs> or don't post something like you're gonna post something Something that you think is more interesting totally. and it's going to have a better reaction. Like people are so worried about like numbers going down and yada, yada, which, and like making stuff every single day. Like, uh, Casey was making yeah, stuff yeah. every single day for a long time. Yeah. And I think what happens if, if you're pretty logical, you're like, I got to stop yeah. for a little bit. Yeah. I need chill because at some point the process overtakes what like the intended result well i also think it's easy to like one of the big mistakes people make with creativity and especially i think like digital content and this is like a really big mistake Mm -hmm. um is they sort of see whatever's popular and they're like i'm gonna do more i'm gonna do that and the issue is that by the time an idea or concept or format's already popular it's like all the sort of early adoption space is gone right it's overly familiar so it's like i always see this i'm like you know i was a tech guy in like 
There are so many tech CEO interview podcasts, like literally so many. And there's a few that are popular and because there's a few that are popular. Everyone keeps starting them because they're like, oh, like, look, people like this. I'm going to do it. It's like, no, no, no. Like the big thing you want to do is you want to find a space where there's like something familiar, right? So like on YouTube, it's like it's video, right? Which people are used to TV, uh -huh. but it's also novel. It's a new format. But then as YouTube matured, the big thing you saw is like, you know, there's plenty of people who came after Connor Franta doing very similar videos who didn't become famous. Yeah. And I would argue a lot of that is just timing. Yeah, for right? sure. Um, and it was so funny. So like as we were doing the book, I remember I was like talking to my publisher and we we're talking about like marketing it and like LinkedIn came out with LinkedIn video. Uh -huh. And I'm in this sort of like marketing space, right? So like LinkedIn's actually a platform I like care about, which is very nerdy. Right. And they launched LinkedIn video and I was like, I just wrote this book all about timing. Like I should start creating LinkedIn video. Now I'm going to read the book on video. Yeah. And so I started <laughs> creating all this uh, LinkedIn video content and I basically took a bunch of ideas that I saw work well on Facebook and Instagram. I, did, I started doing these short form interviews mm -hmm. and LinkedIn video just like took off for me. We're like now like LinkedIn video, I get like, you you're know, a LinkedIn video influencer. Well, it's like really nerdy. <laughs> yeah. It's like, that is like the one channel I have like an audience on. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like, you know, my videos have gotten, it's like a total of 5 million views, which is nothing compared to some of these YouTube people, but it's like, dude, 5 million of something is still yeah, 5 million. It's, it's 5 million. Yeah. And, but the thing is like, I don't think I did anything special other than be early. Yeah. And that's really important. You did a familiar thing. I did a familiar thing in a novel way, in a novel format. Yeah. There's white space. And now I see people on LinkedIn trying to create sort of like I do these 60 second videos with CEOs and people do the same thing. It doesn't work. Uh huh. And I'm like, Oh, you shouldn't do that. And I'm not biased. It's just like literally like, you gotta do 90 seconds. Yeah. Else this shit is dead in the water. <laughs> it's like, that's the thing is like people do what's popular and that's a big, like there's a problem there. Yeah. It's easy to avoid because whatever's popular is what you shouldn't do. Dude. I have this whole thing where my entire YouTube career looks like the creative. <laughs> If you look at my views, like lifetime, really? and it's because I got in on the ground level of something. Yeah. I was a musician at the time, so I was like, wherever I'm able to put my music, like mp3.com, MySpace, whatever, and then YouTube popped up, and I was like, oh, it's just another place where I could put a video version of the stuff that I've been putting in these other places. Uh, eventually, I figured out that I like talking to people more than I like singing <laughs> at people, and then it went up, and it went up, and it plateaued, and then it's come down. Interesting. And then I'm kind of like free to start again. Yeah. And so that's kind of what Mike in the morning is. It's, awesome. it's like, I started watching all these morning shows and I'm like, <laughs> morning shows have been around since the beginning of time yeah. and they're all ridiculous. They're all ridiculous. But they all have a certain, um, couple things that they do. There are segments. They have mugs. They have mugs <laughs> and, uh, they take place in the morning. <laughs> Let's see. You missed it. Yeah. And, uh, but they have like interviews where you learn about new stuff. And my thing now is to always be helpful and funny. It was kind of the through line throughout my entire YouTube career. But now I want to do this. If you want to get super nerdy about it, do it's it. supposed to look like a YouTube uh, or a, um, a morning show that's been taped every morning. That's cool. A physical VHS tape. And then uh, people cut out the commercials. So normally there's like a little glitch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there's like a segment. Do you play pranks? You should play pranks. I don't do you that know that's because like, I hate that You know that's so acted? Much. You know they hire people to do that? Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. One of my friends was Ashton a morning Kutcher show host. was in Pumped. He's such a good actor. <laughs> <laughs> that's the formula. One of my friends was a DC morning show host, um, and he was telling me that literally there's these companies you hire to do these like fake prank calls if you're yeah. a morning show. Yeah, that's nice. And I was like, yeah, but I was like, everything I knew was like a lie. And that's one of the reasons why going back to stand-up where I like – doing what they call crowd work. Are you familiar with no, that? Tell me. It's just going up there and just like finding the jokes in the crowd. Wow. Right. So it's like half written and half crowd work. A lot of the sets that I do. And that's because I think what's that, an example of crowd work is like, you say like, like if you, hey, are you on a date? Like, yeah, let's talk yeah, about yeah. your date. And yeah. then talk about going? that for the next five minutes. Got where it. do you work? Where, where are you got from? It. That kind of thing. Like, Those are like the oldest this guy drinks a lot of craft. Brew. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Sure, so it's like, you're a little mean, but not mean. I mean, it a lot of preconceived notions of that 
crowd work is mean. And really it's all about just like, Banter. I think about it as like podcasting with like 80 people. At Got it. <laughs> so it's like, you just find the humor and everyone has something funny going on. Totally. Or it's my job as a comedian to like make their mundane shit. Do funny. you find with comedy that like, do you win or lose an audience in the first five minutes? So I do a lot of like keynotes. It's very easy to do either one of those things. Cause I find For like sure. if my first five minutes goes well in a keynote, like the rest of it is like, sort of feels like a breeze. Yeah. But if it first time means goes bad, I'm like, Jesus. Well, like, during the first, I was taught during the first like 30 seconds to a minute, a they don't even hear what you're saying. Yeah. And they're just looking at you and they're judging you. And they're like, this guy's this tall. He's wearing <laughs> that. So probably this, this, and yeah. that. And the more you address that, and the more you talk about yourself and make them familiar to who you are, the more, the more things that match up, then they think you're magic. Yeah. And then they'll like be interested. Like, Oh, this guy thinks that this guy's self-aware enough to know what I'm thinking about him. I'm invested in the I next start every minutes. single one of my keynotes with a joke about being in middle school. Yeah. And like, like people always crack up and laugh and like, cause it's like, that's what they're thinking. They're yeah. like, who is this kid up here? Right. Why does he look like he's my son? Yeah. Right. And yeah. so then it's like, it makes it much easier cause we've sort of dealt with that. Yeah. Right. And it's sort of put to the side and people laugh and yeah. they're like, Oh, he's like funny and like self-aware. Like, this and is stuff. me. And I'm like, I've made this joke like 120 times. Yeah. Like, <laughs> well, you got to keep right. Yeah. Well, this <laughs> is the thing that's interesting is I, f- I feel like there's a lot of lessons from stand up in like, and like doing like keynotes and public talks because like yeah because you write jokes and audio, stuff. yeah I have like I have my jokes and so I I like it's one of my goals at some point to like do a workshop or something because I feel like it's like really interesting how yeah. you guys develop tension and how you like build these jokes and like yeah how you cadence them is really cool yeah, yeah for sure and you you definitely should because as soon as you figure out how to tell the the truth through a joke yeah you could start putting them in because all this crazy fucking helpful marketing information that you have or not just, I hate to just put it in the marketing box, but just helpful, like fascinating information that you have about the science of being creative. So helpful. And so you can, I'm guessing just kind of go on autopilot with that yeah. stuff because like it's in a book. Yeah. Like that's a body. I spent of a few years on it. Have. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I know it. <laughs> and so the jokes and the stuff to make it funnier and, and keep people from like zoning out and keep yeah. people paying attention the whole time yeah. is like, those could always be changing. Yeah. There's like a million things about yourself. Totally. You could say you already know the material. So he's about to start making start. fun of me. Yeah. No, no, dude, it doesn't always have to be like that. <laughs> so it can be. How is that's you, what it was in high school. How is YouTube? <laughs> tell me about it. How has YouTube and Instagram changed stand-up comedy? Because on one Holy side, shit. I think it'd be like cool, and that people can like experience you and discover comedians. On the other side, it's like I could watch like sets on on YouTube. I guess I could always have watched them on like Comedy Central or something, yeah. and like I could see less interest. So is it is it sort of like a net positive because more people can access it, or is it? I think it's I think it's a positive because I came from. I've been doing stand up on and off for like 10 years, going really hard at it for like six years. And I started on YouTube and the more I get better and the more I tour to a growing audience, I see so many people being like, this is my first stand up show. Cool. So instead That's of awesome. taking the road, like hey, all this stand up is everywhere and everybody do, does these subtitled uh, videos on Instagram, this yeah. is killing comedy. Yeah. I'll say like, you're just introducing it to a new audience. You got to make, as much stuff about you as possible as to not like step on everybody else's premises and to not talk about, yeah. you know, dating is hard a thousand <laughs> times. You could talk about that, but do it as it pertains to you. Yeah. I was taught comedy is a way to tell the truth and comedy is a way to solve a problem. Hmm. So you're always doing that about and to your own life. I feel like comedy. So I feel like in music, when they went through this issue with like streaming, we're now streaming revenues like way up. So now they like love streaming, but like yeah. for a while they were like, what do we do about it? And they sort of figured out like other ways to monetize. Mm-hmm. They were like, well, let's tour. And now they do like these meet and greets, all this stuff. I feel like stand up comedy, maybe I, I'm missing it. Hasn't yet figured out like how to sort of monetize in a sort of a new world. Like I, I know like when you go to like a concert now, they're like, oh, you can buy the like $500 tickets, the $50 tickets or the like $5,000 tickets. Yeah. Yeah. And like and a touring comedian will do that. Stuff. Oh really? Like That's a lot cool. of VIP tickets. Got it. It's like VIP tickets and regular tickets. Got it. And there's like a meet and greet. But I mean, I like to, I'm in the stage of my career where I like to do the meet and greet with everyone because I'm cool. just thankful yeah. that everybody came out. Yeah, a yeah. lot of comedians that I like and look up to will stand out in the lobby afterwards yeah, yeah. and do that. Like Theo yeah. Vaughn will do that. Dean Del Rey, Andrew Santino, these people will, 
you know, uh, Brian Callen, yeah. they'll stand out front and they'll meet everyone who comes yeah, yeah, to yeah. like a show that they do on the road. Maybe yeah. not in LA so yeah. much, <laughs> but, uh, cause there's just too many people here all the time. <laughs> but, um, I mean, that's another reason. By the it way, is, can we just talk about it for yeah. a second? Just, oh, this just is saw what it? I want to tell you about the chair. Oh, so this I, fell out of one of the chairs. Which chair? We don't know. That's the mystery. Oh my God. And there's really no way to find out. So until fall. <laughs> I say we sit in all of them until one just of us see what for When did this happen? Like today? Recently. Oh my Recently. God. Can I see it? This yeah, is like a serious screw. Those of you who are just you can tell you it's cannot, important because this how is like an integral. But I like to point out, you're probably the only man on the planet who has both a Connecticut and a California yeah. tattoo. I tell people when they ask, like I know what it means, so no one else has to know what it means. But I tell people I'm like the side of an RV where Stop. they put their stickers. Like this which is one came first, <laughs> Connecticut? They were both at the same time. Oh my god! Yeah. Do people even recognize that as Connecticut? Like, no, do people, people always ask. people out here have no idea. Yeah, I've yeah. said something different every yeah. time people. Yeah, you'd be like Rhode Island. They'd be like, oh, okay. Like, yeah, great. It is Connecticut, right? Oh uh, yeah, okay. for sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I started like doubting myself. No, no, no. Did you, you grow up in Connecticut? I grew up in okay. Connecticut. Why did you come out here? I grew up in New Jersey. Oh, I know what it part? happens. Monmouth yeah. County, <laughs> dude. <laughs> it's rough. Why did you come to California? For, uh, for the summer, music and comedy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, for the sun. for the sun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you can't really do stand up Connecticut, uh, stand up comedy in Connecticut. Yeah, you could have done in New York or Chicago. Are yes. those the two places? Um, by the time it it was time to choose whether or not I was going to L.A. or New York, because of me spinning my wheels so much in the music industry in New York, I was kind of done. Like done. And I was like, Yo, if I can go to a place with no winter and yeah. try to do this, <laughs> I'm definitely gonna do that. So I did that. I came out here. Oh, so this was a part. This is all working together. Yeah, it's terrific. Perfect. I'm surprised that I've been able to string together. This <laughs> so I want to talk about the consumption yeah. of a thing. Yeah. So I've seen stand up. I had these VHS tapes of um, this one show HBO used to do called Comic Relief. Mm -hmm. where they used I to remember. Do, right? Yeah, it was really funny. So I used to do that. We had all these like uh, HBO had a series with Rodney Dangerfield where they would do like Dangerfield presents or something, all these comics, these short sets. And I watched them forever, but yeah. it was limited. Yeah. And then I started working in the YouTube stuff. I started watching a lot of YouTube. The Laugh Factory came out with their YouTube channel and they would put stuff up constantly. So yeah. I learned about people like Chris D'Elia, who was very yeah. important in like the development of my whatever. I got to see my friend Andrew Santino kind of blow up from, from these videos and other things he was doing in the traditional entertainment sense get uh, introduced to all these other people that if I was like, oh, I, I'm going to move to LA and I'm going to be That's awesome. on the Laugh Factory thing someday. So that that ended up happening. But when I first moved here, I was like, you know, I'm Italian from the Northeast. I always had a ton of friends. Yeah. I moved out here and I had like no friends. Yeah. I had maybe three friends. And the extrovert tops. in you was like, what is happening? Yeah, dude. <laughs> and I got like super moving that far away from so many friends and family that I loved was like super depressing. And that was the thing that I was not expecting at all. So I was super depressed every night. So I would call Santino and I'd be like, you know, are you going up everywhere? And I would buy a ticket. And eventually he would be like, if you want to come see me, let me know and I'll, I'll get you in yeah, yeah, these yeah. places. So every night of the week I started going <laughs> to the Laugh Factory. That's awesome. The most. And uh, the improv and all these places, and I would watch him, and I would watch these people that I would watched on YouTube in Connecticut in real life. So the first maybe year or two was just going to watch people constantly. And it's literally like the most consistent thing you find with creatives that they're all like super fans. Like they're all like you. Like there's, there yeah. aren't people who are like great musicians who don't like music, right? Dude, and it that's kind of one makes of the sense. things that annoys me about comedy is that it's like. It is a very big like bravado like boys club. Yeah, yada, yeah. Yada. There's a lot of like machismo that comes with it and a lot of people are scared to let on how much of a fan they are yeah and i'm always like i'm not gonna do that because you're supposed to be living your truth yeah, right? yeah, yeah. so i'm not gonna like you're like i'm geeking out like, this <laughs> right, is great right well one of the other things that's interesting though is um so in the book i also talk a lot about communities and one of the things i think is so interesting with creativity and you're sort of like living this right is how important the idea of like being in like the epicenter is. So there's this term in sociology called clustering, yeah. which is basically that like every stand-up comedian that moves to LA makes the value of other stand-up comedians moving to LA higher. And so you get this positive flywheel effect and you find like one of the most important things if you want to be successful in creative field is move to the damn epicenter, yeah. right? Great, you want to be a fine art painter? 
move to New York. Mm -hmm. Like you're not going to get it done in Minneapolis. And that's one of those things I think is like a tough truth for people because we live in the internet age and like it feels very democratized. It feels like you could do whatever, wherever. I think about like music, right? With music, like, yeah, there's like different gatekeepers, but now it's not like everyone. Like the gatekeepers are now like the people who curate the Spotify playlist and Uh they live in LA and New York and the shows they go to are in LA and New York. And so if you want to be music, you better live in LA or New York. For sure. And so you just find that even in the internet age, right? Where you physically live is so, so important. Yeah. And I think people want to pretend it's not, but mm-hmm. like, no, no, you, you got to move. Like yeah. you literally need to move. For sure. Yeah. And another thing that's happening with like, you know, all these comedians have these super um, popular podcasts mm-hmm. and they're, you know, the comedy store is like packed every night, all these places. And what that is doing, what I see it doing in other cities like Philadelphia and, uh, um, you know, like Chicago and Boston, like they each have their own scene now. Yeah. And you know, LA and New York have very specific things and it's definitely the biggest and it's both the toughest places, but it it used to be like there are one or two places everywhere else and now there's more. Yeah. So you could get good somewhere else and then come here. hundred percent. You can build your way up. And that's one of the things though, but it's interesting to think about the podcast. Like you're talking about like, you know, um, like people you're friends with like yeah. part of it is like they're here right you can like have each other on your podcast yes. you can boost each other up you go and see each other you feel that like little bit of like friendly competitive pressure of like mm-hmm. wow that was like really good like I want to do that yeah and, like I always think it's really fascinating for a while when Vine was a thing um, all the Vine stars lived in that one apartment building in LA <laughs> which was on Vine Street which I thought was kind of cute yeah but they all lived there and they were experience. yeah and they were all like <laughs> doing videos with each other and uh-huh. like they were making each other famous and so I think the sort of community aspect of creativity is important because it also goes in opposition to this idea of the like lone wolf creator who's off. Like I always think Steve Jobs is the funniest because people are like, wow, Steve Jobs, like he did all this stuff. And I'm like, first of all, day one, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. Like he was yeah. like, I don't know how to code. Yeah, like yeah, I'm going to yeah. get that guy. He hired, he raised money very early. He had multiple employees. Like, Throughout, like, think about when Apple was designing the iPod. They had thousands and thousands of engineers. This was not Steve Jobs in some workshop, right? Mm-hmm. So oftentimes, I think we mistake the sort of, like, marketing and PR version of creativity with the real story of creativity. And that makes people feel like, well... Which is a collaborative... Yeah. And they yeah. feel like, well, if I'm not Steve Jobs, like, if I can't do everything myself, which mm-hmm. he didn't actually do, how am I going to do it? Dude, I can't tell you how how long I've spent like cooped up by myself trying to work out jokes yeah. and then I'll text someone and be yeah, like, Hey, can you help me with this? Do you think that this is funny at all? Yeah. And they're like, Oh, put this here. Yeah. And then it's so much funny. hundred percent. Then you're excited to go out and do it. When I was doing music, I was, I don't think I was ever a super dick when I was <laughs> in a band, but I definitely what kind had of band were you of in? like a, mostly like rock and pop, I guess. It's like a pop punk band. A Not punk. Like rockish. Like what? Kind, like give me a comparable. I'm like really curious now. Switchfoot. Okay. <laughs> really? Oh my god. I always thought I we were like. It. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. Right. It was like pop rock. Type yeah. Stuff. I okay. Don't know how to... it came I was from like my a. I was like heart. a pop punk warp tour kid. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. I was like. Who was it? Yeah. Who Newfound didn't Glory. Have a oh, box. <laughs> yeah. so good. Fallout Boy. Like. I have a friend in that place with a. Uh, we the Kings. Now. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, like, yeah. I know who they are. My friend yeah. Coley plays my dude. I don't know how this happened, but my friend Coley from my wife was actually friends with him. She introduced me to him. Coley O'Toole plays guitar in this pop punk. Yeah. yeah. And then another person who used to frequent and work at the bar that Zoya used to work at. My wife now plays, who was also friends with Coley now plays with, a. Panic at the Disco. That's awesome. And I'm like, what is happening? Well, I have like this like Spotify pump, pop punk playlist, which I yeah. listen to way more than Who probably doesn't? should. But it's like one of those <laughs> things where like I saw Warp Tour a year ago had a Warp Tour like nostalgia cruise. And yeah. I was like, I'm getting old. Like I was like, I never felt like First I was- First of all, it's on a cruise. Yeah. It's like, it's like, <laughs> literally, it was called like Warp Tour Rewind. And I was like, what is happening? <laughs> like, oh my God. Yeah, yeah. But it's like, yeah, and those guys are, some of them are still playing and now they're like, and they're like, late 30s early 40s and yeah. it's like whoa <laughs> they're not any less good yeah i still want to do it yeah no i'm like i'm like very i like like the new newfound glory album that came out like two years ago yeah for sure <laughs> and there should be almost no shame in that What's almost, no shame. <laughs> yeah. almost no shame but like being in a band and playing music i remember being super skeptical about 
taking other people's ideas and working collaboratively because one, I didn't know how rights were split mm. up because no one ever told me that. Yeah. So I was like, I, I get to keep Seems all to the rights me. if I don't, yeah. you know, and that way I'm not putting any pressure on anybody else or like looping them into like what will be a fiasco later on. We could just keep it real simple and real clean. And that's the way I thought yeah. about it. But everything, even my music, like the music I used to write in the early 2000s compared to the very last song I put out, which was in like 2016, 15. Uh, it's called You and Me. It's on Spotify. It did better than anything else hmm. that I've ever put out. And it sounds and so much note. different. Yeah, yeah for yeah. sure. I'm, right, done. I'm good. That's it. Peace. Uh, and it, it felt good yeah. to go out on a high note yeah. like that too, you know? And it was because it was such a collaborative effort between me and this guy, Jeremy Hatcher. And then like every time I, I got exponentially better, it was because I was collaborating with Darian Cunning, who was my favorite musician in Connecticut, or collaborating with this guy, Mike Mangini, who produced stuff for the Jonas Brothers and stuff well, like that. Well, it's like literally if you look at song credits on Spotify, which I love that they have that like one click, it's like yeah. mostly songs that have like 12 people involved. For sure. And it's like, and it's like I get that, right? Yeah. It's like the same thing with a TV show in a writer's room. Mm -hmm. Like there's something about beating up an idea and that sort of gets something really interesting, which is one of the things I found when I was doing my research was that um, I looked at some companies. Like what do companies do to make creativity work? So like I spent a day with the Ben and Jerry's flavor team, which yeah. is like, like what a great job. One of my favorite but parts of the book. They're all like skinny, which I think is really weird. <laughs> I'm like, but the thing they do, which is interesting is like exercise self-control. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they, well, it's all about psychological safety. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think you see that in creative fields where the thing that's important is like, Hey, this is how I think you should tweak that joke, but you don't feel like, a sense of shame for me telling you that, or you don't feel a sense of like criticism. Everybody's just trying to make each other better. And that makes it part of the process. And that psychological safety element is really important. So if you're trying to build a creative team or a creative community, if you don't have psychological safety, it doesn't work mm -hmm. because you need that back and forth. And so when you hear like TV writers talk about like good writer's room versus bad writer's room, it's about psychological safety. When yeah. you look at like why was Pixar so successful when Disney animation wasn't until they bought Pixar and then transferred over the Pixar process, is the entire Pixar animation process was about building psychological safety. They have very long timelines. They have these big group feedback sessions. Mm -hmm. They sort of set, when they're talking to the writers and the directors, they're saying, look, it's gonna take four years, not one year, because we wanna keep iterating on it to make it better. And so since that's part of the process, like it's not scary to get notes, yeah, right? Yeah. And so that idea of psychological safety is like so important and so easy to just forget that. Mm -hmm. And these are all things that I wish you learned in a more um like in a at a college level yeah, yeah, yeah. or at like a your last year in high school yeah because i i definitely would have gotten further faster if i knew that that's how it was supposed to be and another thing that's crazy about la is that everyone's at a different mental and emotional state yeah so i would have friends in the comedy world who you know, it's, it's very competitive and it's very like everyone here is very self-centered, but not always in the bad way. Mm -hmm. Like you move from wherever you move from to be able to make your life, whatever yeah, you want. They're just it. moving. It's just a, a very independent yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. Right. So people are kind of have the blinders up all the time. So there have been people I've been friends with in the comedy community in the past who something good would happen for me. And I would know just because of the relationship that we have that I couldn't tell them without them. Mm feeling bad about it mm -hmm. or feeling bad about themselves about it. Mm -hmm. And then that's when I kind of cut ties with people Totally, because I'm like, that's not no, healthy. we got to be in a place where we could like, we're always trying to make each other better. I want the best for yeah. you. Like we're not, I'm not in competition with any. You want to be like inspired by your friends for sure. Motivated by your friends and their success. You don't want to be upset with their success. Yeah, right. Yeah. And those are very different nuances. Like I was talking to some YouTubers and they're talking about how like, it's really cool when you see other YouTubers as a few years ago start to do these big brand deals mm -hmm. and or be on TV. Yeah. And then they were like, that's not competitive, but it's like, it's a friendly pressure feeling like, whoa, if they can do that, like that means I could probably do that. Like that's exciting and motivating, but if yeah. it becomes this thing of like, you want other people not to do well, like in a creative community that just falls completely apart. Yeah, for sure. The other thing I thought was really interesting. I see this in comedy too is, um, this idea of what I call a prominent promoter, which is in creative fields you see very, very frequently that more successful people with bigger reputations 
tend to lend their reputation to people coming up. Mm -hmm. So like in bands, comedy, there's openers. Yeah. Right? That's a great example mm -hmm. of it. Dude. And it, like, it's so many, the host and the feature are always like a lesser person. I just mm -hmm. feature with my friend Lucas for uh, Lucas Hurl should say first and last. Yeah, just in case. Yeah. Google uh, it. With, uh, down in La Jolla at the La Jolla comedy store with uh, Dean Del Rey. So Dean is like the past regular, uh, he's the veteran. Yeah. And then he takes me and Lucas. Totally. So we can go, you know, do 15 minutes a night for six nights straight to get better. We can listen to feedback from him. And what's so funny about that, by the way, is that when people see that, they sort of get like, oh, okay, I get why that's helpful for you. What they don't get is that it's actually also helpful for Dean. For a few reasons. One, it feels good. But two, there's actually all this research about people that have long creative careers. The thing they do is they keep incorporating new ideas and novelty into their process, yeah. right? And so that's why, like, again, it's a blend of the familiar and the novel. If you've been doing stand-up for a long time and you're not being exposed to new ideas or new styles, right, you over time lose your edge because yeah. you become overly familiar. So, like, I interviewed David Rubenstein, billionaire, 69, one of the, like, founders of private equity, and he's like famous for like, he's had this crazy long career and he always has all these like young executives. Like he's always bringing these young executives, these men and women who yeah. are like, who are like, you know, a little too raw. Young executives are my favorite uh, SoundCloud rap group. Right? Really? No. Oh, I was like, I was like <laughs> that'd be kind of cool. But like, that's so important because it actually makes him better. Yeah, for like, sure. Like so there's actually a selfish motivation too, which is fine. Uh -huh. And so I think that's important when people think about like, you know, helping people who aren't um, as successful as them. Don't just think about it as charity, right? Yeah. It's actually part of your job too. For sure. Yeah. And I, th I think he knows that. And I have said that there are two different types of like creative professionals, but I, I say comedians for sure that I've seen. There's the people who will never stop writing and are always looking for ways to make themselves better, like physically and mentally yeah, and yeah. emotionally, you know? And Dean is like in that crowd 100%. Most of the comedians that I know are in that crowd 100% always writing, always record literally everything. Dean has a record of every <laughs> show he's ever done for the past nine years. He has a recording of every show he's ever done for nine years. And he's so if he like thought a joke was really good, he can go back or if he thought it came to off everything. Yeah, that's cool to everything and listens to everything and, uh, and writes based on that, always making his shit better. But that's the thing. It's, then, it's iterative. It's not like he's just writing the joke and saying like, Peace. exactly. Yeah. This is it. This must be funny. Cause it came from, from yeah. my perfect. Or like brain. they laughed, right? Well, like, yeah. could they laugh more? Could right? they be more into it? Could they yeah. be like keeling over? Right. Like, exactly. Yeah. The iterative thing is really interesting because like, I always found like you sort of the image of someone writing a book is like, they go into like a writing cabin and like write a book and they're like, peace. Always and done. in the woods. And like reality, like, like writing a book and all of my author friends, it's like the most painstakingly iterative. You like rewrite and rewrite and rewrite and you get feedback and you rewrite some more. Yeah. And think about movies like with like test screenings and previews and like recuts and like, or with screenplays with rewrites, like so much about creativity is about reworking. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, people are like, well, my first draft sucks, so I must not be creative. And they miss out the like professional creatives like the rewriting is a huge part of what they do. Yeah. Huge part. And that's why I have the utmost respect for like, I'll see people who are passed at a club. They're paid regulars, which yeah. means they can put in their availability and basically get, you know, 15 minutes a night, wherever they want to go. If they don't get a show, they'll be out at either a bar show or a show that's like way beneath them or even an open mic because they don't want any yeah, they days work to it. go by where they're not working on. Yeah, stuff. Yeah. So the other type of comedian is where it's like, I wrote this. I'm funny. Now I just wait for what I'm owed. Yeah. And what I deserve. Yeah. Which can work for a bit, but over time it eventually like catches up with you. Cause people yeah. are like, eh. and you always hear like these really famous comedians, like they love the craft of it. Like they yeah. love the idea of getting better at it. They love the idea of working it out. They love the idea of like messing with their style and like yeah. seeing what they can do. Dude, this has been exactly what I wanted. Great. To I'm just happy that we had mugs. Thank you so much again for watching Mike in the Morning. Ooh, I appreciate you being here so much. You know who else I appreciate? The sponsors of this channel. They give five bucks every month, get five extra things, and one of those things is getting their name on screen at the end of the video. And so here's that. Take like, them these up. are... Take it. Oh my God. Are you comfortable bringing that on the plane? Yeah. Because that would, would I... be the only... Why would I not be comfortable bringing a mug on because the plane? Because sometimes this is a weapon? Shit break. Oh. Well, technically. Could be. <laughs> Depends on how you use it. I hope this it. gets aired after my flight. <laughs> Dude, thank, thank you. you so much for coming. It's awesome. Appreciate it. Everyone go get the book. Tell them where to get the book. Uh, Amazon or thecreativecurve.com.
awesome. The, the cover's beautiful. Who did oh, the art? The same guy who did the Fall in Our Stars. Uh, oh, Rodrigo good shit. Corral. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Perfect YouTube uh, integration. We love it.